A very, very warm welcome to you, Carol Sanford, to the Conscious Consulting Podcast. We are extremely happy to have you in our podcast, and we are very much looking forward to this conversation with you. And thank you very much for taking the time and being with us for this next uh, hour, approximately. Well, thanks for inviting me. I've enjoyed talking with you too already. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Um, so, Carol, I have. Uh, I would like to go directly into the conversation. As we've known, you're somebody who's really direct without a lot of, of ado to the point. Um, I see that you you um, are or, or you call yourself an educator, not a consultant, not a coach, a regenerative educator. Um, would you like uh, or could you tell us about what that role includes? What are you doing and what does it mean? Well, you, I run a community called the Regenerative Educator, so I can't answer that question, all of that, uh, but let me give you a flavor of it. Um, the word educator is Latin, and it means to draw out, not to put in. In English, the word duct, duct tape, ductile, ducts, all are conductors. But they're conductors, not of something goes into the system. They're always the ex, uh, ex, um, exiting, I guess, would be a way to say it. So when you're in a regenerative educator role, you're trying to draw out of people what is in them by giving them the capability to think better and to be a resource is the role you are there for them. And resource means to return people to themselves as a source. So the role of educator is not a knowledge conveyor. So there's one of the knots, right? It is not an expert uh, that is more powerful than the learner. The way I think about educating is I set something for myself, an aim. Like today, I woke up and I knew we were going to be here. And I thought about what is my aim today? And I said to myself, be humble. Because the real thing that you have to do is break apart the hierarchies that you get in educational institutions and in parenting in work situations. And so humility is something we all need. There's a lot of narcissism gets in when you've got the expert role that you can throw in some solipsism with that, which is the world, whole world revolves around me and my expertise. And so for me, uh, because I have created a lot of output in life, you know, I got books and <laughs> 800 videos and I've got so much crap, right? <laughs> that's in the world that I have to remember most of that was uh, the ability to receive some energy in a group of people. And I am lucky enough to be the one to put it on paper or uh, something. So I think educator is a way of reminding me that my role is to resource others returning to themselves. And my work is to be the Socratic process that allows them to rediscover and build a better way of thinking so they can teach themselves. And, and when you do that, because listening to you, I can very much relate to what you're saying. And at the same time, there's a lot of uh, people who seduce you into this role of knowing it. People are very much educated to look for solutions outside of themselves, to look for somebody to tell them what to do, to give them the recipe. So in a way, they are expecting someone to tell them something, especially if you call yourself a consultant. They want you to, to show them the way, to give them the answers, to be the expert. And um, I would be really interested in how you deal with this invitation that maybe some of your clients sometimes also address to you to ask you but carol how should i do it what could i do do you have do you know this tension or this situation and and how do you deal with it so i have no one who asks that for me anymore zero but it takes a whole lot of building a different foundation you don't do it one at a time with one person uh, who comes up to you, but you do remind, like I have membership communities 
people, I'm not a consultant. I say to them, I have no answers, zero answers. Don't ask me for any of them. I want you to learn to trust your own lived experience. And I'm very confronting. And then when people come back to me again and they say, well, can I run something by you? And I said, oh, you'd rather trust my lived experience than yours, right? And they go, no, 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 that's <laughs> not what I want to do. So I make it very clear to people in my behavior. I, I, If I find myself giving an answer or I have one I think might help, I say, well, I have premises, but they're not tested by you. So I can give you a premise. And then if you want to go test it, you can. But boy, don't do it because I say, because I'm wrong so much of the time. You can't imagine how often people use my example. Like I had people who read about what I did with my kids, which was starting where they were six. I asked them, what one thing would you like to really steward in our household? And you want to use us as resources to help you. So uh, my daughter picked clean her room. Uh, and then when they're nine, I asked them to pick a system they want to be responsible for. She picked money, paying all our bills. People read that in my book and starting at 12, 13 or 14 years old, they said, pick something you want to do. And then they instructed them how to do it. People get in trouble because you don't know all that went on in the experience I had when I give you an idea. So don't trust me. That's how I deal with it. Plus, I write it everywhere. I write articles about epistemology, you know, how people learn and develop. I write about theory of change. And so uh, people don't come to me assuming, unless they've never met me, and then they learn in a hurry. I don't give answers. Uh, I teach people to trust. So you have to make it. You can't take your current clients uh, and then um, you, you're going to have to start this new with the next possible client. But my clients also come from referrals. I don't talk to people who say, I'd like to hire you because the word hire tells me all I need to know. Yep, you can't hire me. I'm not hireable. Uh, we could collaborate on something, but you know, we have to work. So the minute people say the very first words out of their mouth, I disrupt. And the minute they are getting used to be disrupt, disrupt, disrupt their language, their ideas. And if they have something they want to test with me, I say, well, let's, let's pull out the four paradigms and you assess where you are, where your questions coming from where your answer is coming from. And I walk them through uh, the four eras of history and where we are and to say, now you answer your own question and, and I'll be here. I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions. So you become what you're talking about. You don't fight against it. You stop calling yourself a consultant because you have to break the association. And, so, and when you do that, though, you also say, now, you don't want me being a consultant. You, you think you do because you, like me and all of us, were raised with the teacher knows more, daddy knows more, the pope knows more, our minister. We're raised that way. But you also know that inside your own head, you question them all the time. You're always working. Does that make sense? Does that work in my life? That's the part I want you to get connected to. And I'll tell you, Every major client says to me, when every other person who comes in here, every consultant, when they leave, most of the spirit goes with them. Most of the way to think goes with them. Uh, sometimes even the knowledge, everything, everything they're trying to sign goes with them. It's gone. When you leave, capability is all still here. That's what we want. What I understand is that it's not about bringing something in, but bringing something out of a system right. and, and, and creating the conditions that it can come out of themselves. Now, I do put a lot of stuff in, but none of them are answers. All of them are frameworks about how to think. They're all capability. That's very different than programs. Then here's 
the here's our values discussion. I don't go in and say, let's talk about your values and get a value statement, a mission statement. I try and get them to throw all that out. And I teach them a way uh, to think about strategy that's very different than they've ever done. And the first thing I say to them is everyone I've ever worked with who learns to think about strategy this way um, earns over the next five years 35 to 65% improvement in their cash flow. Do you want to do that? Otherwise, you can go get somebody who will teach you how to do strategy and, or they'll do it with you. And then where they're gone, you'll maybe have a slight bump for a little while. My clients all right that they have a permanent ability to grow and increase their revenue, but it will feel uncomfortable when we start. You will sure I'm wrong. I, this couldn't be how you do it. And that's because you've been conditioned in a way that I'm going to bring you answers, not that you're going to get better at your own answers. So when you work with your clients on, on strategy in that whole new way, um, what would be the difference in, from how they were teach to think about strategy? Um, well, first, I'm not going to do much of that because you can't tell it to people. It's an experiential thing. Secondly, I never do anything twice, ever. So I don't have a program. I bring them. But the first thing I'm going to do is teach them a framework that would be about reflecting on themselves. Like um, one of the major uh, frameworks that comes out of... Um, a guy named John G, John G. Bennett, I liked. And he writes incredibly esoteric books. So you're, you're all going to be disappointed if you go try and look him up. Uh, he's English or he's long dead. But he says, D can you tell when you're reactive? You know, you're pushing back, arguing, being protective, defensive, holding stuff. Can you tell when your ego is hooked? Where you're trying to position, create your point, uh, prove but also be discerning and you know be fully in there and can you tell when you're purposeful can you tell when you're serving not your purpose but a greater purpose and i usually throw in humans don't have purposes i lie to themselves we have we serve purposes that's our role and if we get so at every meeting we look at two or three times while we're working what gets you hooked and makes you reactive what gets you uh, your ego stuck and you're fighting it and what keeps you purposeful. And then we develop maybe some ways to work so they can stay purposeful. And then I might say, how does that fit how you do strategy? And they go, oh my God, we're incredibly reactive we're against competition. We got all these things uh, or we're arrogant. We're going to be number one. Uh, and so now we've got a start. Uh, and then I begin to give them some more in-depth frameworks, which none of the words would mean anything now if I told you, because it requires them discovering. I always start with people discovering their own answers before I give them mine. That sounds very, actually very therapeutic to me, listening to how you approach. <laughs> I have been a psychotherapist a long time ago, and this was actually a kind of process you just described in terms of What's in there? What is your intention? What is you? What are you up to? And not how should you behave according to somebody else's expectations? Yeah, I've been called an organizational therapist, but what I really believe is we shouldn't divide out something called therapy and have a therapist. Now we have an expert, right? Uh, that what we have, I also, when I do strategy, teach them a whole new way to think about earnings, margins, and cash flow right after we do that. Now, people go, okay, that's not therapy, right? I have a master's degree in business. I taught in business schools. I know how earnings, margin, cash flow get produced. I'm not an accountant, but I know how you make them. I've owned two companies. I know how to lead and make money and sell and mergers and divestitures and um, partnerships and contract. I mean, there ain't anything I don't know about business. But while we're, well, that's not true. Ton, be humble. There's <laughs> tons of things I don't know. But I know the core things about how to give guidance to an overall business. But I know that if they aren't working on internal self-management, which we should be working, learning at the needs of our parents or guardians, 
We should be learning it in school. We should be learning it in every business class. We wouldn't go to therapy because we would be learning it from a child. So it's not therapy. Therapy is after you're, quote, broken. This is personal development. So yeah. to me, it's all woven. And that's how I do strategy and leadership and management and work design and all those problem solving. Anything I'm teaching people, that's woven in everywhere. Yeah. But if we understand you right, you, you start with the one in the core or whoever is asking you to, inviting you to that conversation. Because what we, what, yeah, how we approach our clients is exactly in this way that we think it is all about you. It's not about the system you represented. You, you allow the system to unfold. You, you cultivate the system. You're the guardian to your organization. And your mindset uh, very easily becomes, or the limits of your mindset very easily become the limit of the organization. So work, we work with their limits then and not with the organization. Well, that's not what I do. I work with nested. So individuals are nested in a company which is nested in a market and industry a world. And we work on all three of those at the same time. And so I believe they are every decision they're making responsible for the, the greater whole of their industry, et cetera. They're responsible for the business, but they all happen at the same time. And so I don't tell them not to work on those greater things. I tell them to notice how everything they're doing is creating what are happening, which I think is what you're saying. My behavior, our decisions, uh, our engagement is creating the kind of culture we have in a company every day. So while you're making a choice, notice that, pay attention to both, and then notice what the culture and the strategy of the organization as a whole is, is creating the democracies we have. Uh, if we're at the internal level, training people, teaching them, evaluating them, telling them what to think, they don't know how to be voters in a democracy. Because every time uh, an election comes up, the majority of people now go ask somebody else how to vote. They don't know how to assess what's going on. And they don't learn a company, they don't learn a family, they're all the same thing. So for me, the nestedness is an important message. And I, introduce that very early and often and we'll have frameworks that say now look at it remember our three levels whatever you put on those three levels think about all of those so um i think th the system is core and i'm always working on having them learn to do systems thinking while they do also work on themselves mm -hmm. did that translate yes absolutely <laughs> i usually have a flip chart and i'm writing on the board it drives me crazy i'm using my hands so but would you define framework or or a sketch out framework to well framework is so just listen, what is that what are you talking about when you talk it's about the framework? order it's how your your mind is organizing and ordering itself to see the world so reactive ego purposeful is a framework it's how we are always in one of those. It's how we're organizing and ordering our thinking as a lens to see the world. But they're invisible to most of us because no yeah. one teaches us frameworks. They teach us models, which are uh, what something is. It has the answers on it. Frameworks don't have any answers in them. They have the arena to ask questions. So the minute I've got reactive ego and purposeful, I can ask a million different questions that would help people assess where they are. I could, uh, and they would always know where I am. They would always be able to see. Now, what we used to do with models is we teach the uh, answers and you a model is you know, model airplane. It's like how you build the airplane. So when you've got a model, it has, you do this, you do that, you do this, and even lists or models. Um, but when we do that, we're programming people's minds with answers, not developing their capability to form their own questions. 
it's really challenging this kind of work because as we said, people are scanning, they're used to scan the world for models, for answers, for guidance. Right. That is right. very direct. Out there. Um, and it and it's always out there and they want to have Don't it. do it anyway. Yeah. So the thing they, they, I thought they, about yeah. don't don't give them answers. I mean, and you have to break it early i think it's you you say they're used to it well yeah the people who come to me are used to it but they immediately the minute i say you'd rather trust me than you what if i give you the ability to come up with your own answers there are I, not everybody in the world responds to that mm -hmm. but you would be amazed how so many do and uh if you're at a high enough level in a company uh you can get them to be the umbrella i call it for a lot of people getting an opportunity to do that and then you switch the culture so i just don't work with people who want but people don't work with me i may have said to you before i think i did that when people uh continue to push but how do you do that what's this and what and how did you do that i say you know I don't even know the answer. I begin to look as dumb as I can to them. It's like, I'm not going to be of any use to them. And I keep saying, God, I can't answer that question. I, d I don't know. And pretty soon they don't want to hire me and we're, we're good. Mm. But I never have to say, I'm not going to work for you. Um, we came up with this lovely question in, in preparation. Or you came up with this beautiful question is how can we align our spiritual path and unfolding self with our work in the world of existence. And, and I think at this point, it's, it's a very interesting question to ask because I guess that also your path, your, the way how you work has changed and transformed with your own spiritual and unfolding self and development over your life. I can see it in myself. I'm now working totally different than I did like 20 or 20 sure. years ago. Of course, there is an an alignment and at the same time it is challenging for people who are maybe not best authors and have this uh, still you're talking although you don't give the answer you still talk from a place of authority or natural authority or authority that you have um, worked on and, and you have earned cultivated um, sometimes it is not so easy for a lot of my colleagues also for ourselves i think we have we are a little bit down the way to say you know um, i myself i wouldn't give them the answers i have made the experience that i would love to work like this and this but i'm i'm afraid i'm afraid to really bring in what i really believe in in my work because as we say a lot of clients expect something and they are worried if it's too confrontative if it's too irritating they will not make a livelihood so we talked about this and it is a challenge to, to bring, to align those different paths, the own development, the like external reality and how to shift it. And you have worked with many people along the way with your regenerative groups, with a lot of case studies that you've been doing. And could you share with us, uh, maybe from your own experience and also for other people, how did they overcome this hindrance, this somehow, anxiety to really go fully into it and express themselves in their job the definition of fear is unable to relate to the situation at hand mm -hmm. and the minute you say you're afraid if you ever enter a meeting like with that with clients you're dead you have to enter with knowing that how you work is going to transform their lives and it's going to create a better planet on which we all live. And that if you can help them see that, it's going to make a huge difference. And you're only going to work the way you know it works. And I, I do have, you know, we'll decide when and if you want to do this. I have kind of a thing I do with all my change agents, which are a mixture of consultants, trainers, coaches, mentors, small business owners, leaders in companies. I have something we work on all the time to get them clear, because most of the reason you can't stand in those confident shoes is you don't know when you're, uh, how would I say this? You don't know what you're standing on. You don't know what the answer is to what it would look like completely when you're standing in what you believe in your unfolding life and who you are. And we work on getting that clear. 
you create a comprehensive, um, I call them levels of order about how the universe works. And if you create these, this process, and I've not written this much in public space, but you have to create that. So you are listening through that. What is the right thing for the world? What is my role? It is important for me to be, and don't think I'm never afraid because I'm afraid, uh, but I have this master framework I go to that in my head says, here's my epistemology. Here's how I think real learning takes place, real development. All that other stuff does, does not meet that. Secondly, I have a, a real clear idea about my cosmology, how the world works, and my paradigms within that. And when I hear people outside of that, I know it's time to develop capability, not to uh, try and train them, but to give them an ability to write their own cosmology, epistemology, then an ontology, how do humans work? We as well-intended people have contaminated our sacred work with the humanist movement. And the humanist movement, I understand, it was so much worse than the bad stuff, the behaviorists who did rewards, recognition, punishment. And it was so much better than machine theory that we leapt on it. And now we have messed up our work in the world with humanist theory. Until we can go back to living systems and sacred systems understanding, uh, of an ontology about humans, we can't do, do much. And the thing that I have that is the most powerful behind that is I have a technology. I have a very precise set of how to do everything you're asking. And that's why I bring people into communities to learn that technology, to write their own epistemology, uh, cosmology and, and ontology but then learn a technology which you can work with people, you can work with yourself. Uh, and it takes years to switch from the one you're using uh, because you've, you've, you, and I'm, I'm saying all of you and your listeners, not you bad people, we all have been indoctrinated with humanist theories to try and overcome all the stuff we learned in the bad view. But it's not, it makes us all anthropocentric. It makes us narcissistic. It makes us solipsistic. And because of that, we can't see living systems and the nestedness. And we do all these wonderful, beautiful things with lovely questions, but we don't have a comprehensive understanding of the sacred principles of how the world works, how human works to draw on. So there. <laughs> there I also see a big difference in, in your approach from what I comprehend is to go away, as you say, from this humanistic framework that for many people already is a big achievement, as you yeah. also say, like putting humans in the center of everything, this, this human humanistic way of thing, thing is, is going and to, to be fully respectful of all living systems and and a, a beautiful word that you just say, it's a sacred work. And it's yeah. a sacred world also that we are facing. And, uh, and there was one, one part of our book that touched me especially deeply is looking at a living system as a whole with its own essence, without yeah. tearing everything apart in order to find essence or it's it it's it, it's uh try to understand it by putting away and analyzing everything but looking at it and sensing the 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 essence of the whole be it an organization be the family be the person be it an animal be it a, a, a wood be it be the be it the, it's the planet so they're nested there there's every hole is nested in a in another yeah. hole um, but this is uh, something I find especially important yeah. in, in, a, in a mechanistic world. You're trying to understand, to comprehend everything with, with your mind and not just being with something and, and sensing the essence of what it is. Well, you don't sense it and you don't be with it. So that's part of what we have to learn. That's a humanist idea. We can sense it. Our senses can pick it up. You use your mind, but you use it very differently. 
and you learn to see the working of something, not the fixedness of something. So we're used to seeing maybe you could on any one day see your child as a whole, but what we do is see them as fixed. We don't see them as working and alive. That's the key to living systems. We go to not respecting it and treating it with awe. We instead understand how it's trying to work. What's our role in working with it? How do we create an, uh, a way of working that gives it more capacity to be itself? Like life sheds, and I created that word as far as I know, is much better than watersheds because watersheds, life sheds, food sheds, air sheds, all of those are fragments and we have different groups working on them. Only the uh, whole of a life shed with all of that in it has an essence, but you have to learn how to see it. You can't sense it. You can't say, what is it? And come up with an answer. It'll take you about 10 years, not you personally, the average person, to learn to see essence and get over the sensitive energy idea from the humanist movement that if we're just quiet and we sit in the woods or we sit with the child, it'll come to us. Nope, you're looking at it through the wrong frameworks and filters and models. So we have to learn to do all of that. Um, but but li listening to you with, with the framework, the way of thinking that you're teaching, couldn't it also happen that that the thinking becomes very rigid and less intuitive well i'm not interested in intuitive thinking that's an excuse for not thinking it's a humanist idea uh what i'm very interested in building the capability see you just assume somebody's thinking is fixed at any moment i can say the way we get stuck is attachments and identification and then the mind is being hindered The, mind, the humanists also got, a, got us to think we should be less intellectual and more emotional. All, that's, a disaster, that's a recipe for disaster because it means we can't see ourselves. We let go of our mind. We don't use it for its right work. We instead have our emotions do our thinking is what it's saying. We work with a framework that talks about uh, instinctive, not intuitive, moving center, emotional center, intellectual center, higher emotional and higher intellectual center, which are sacred. And I think they're what we're hinting at when we say intuition. But for us, it's still us looking for it. You leave the, your self-centeredness when you go into those higher centers, and then you can be an instrument of service, but you don't do anything. You, Your intuition gets out of the way because All intuition means 90% of the time is what's familiar to me. And so I put it in the box of, which is no better than, as you said, uh, a mind that's not working well. I, I really thought it's interesting also to our listeners to, to get a sense of how you work with your clients. Um, and you've been working with uh, clients uh, from, as we say, Google, I think, and, and P&G and big corporates. It's not the whole company. It's always a leader or two. And most of them get promoted continuously through the time they're there because they were doing this kind of work, developing themselves. And I usually get to go with them. So I never look at a company. I look at a leader. And whether that leader, and maybe this is the most important answer to the question about how you get people to work the way I do, you don't. You be the way you are and it attracts the people that are willing to work that way. And when they're willing to work that the way, they get into the mix, they bring you in to work with their people. And I don't go out seeking clients anymore. I work only with membership communities of people like you who want to go out in the world. I'm too old to get on airplanes anymore. Uh, I do still meet with Google uh, on Zoom Uh, and with people they bring in in their labs, their innovation labs. But for the most part, I don't have clients. Mm -hmm. I am mostly helping other people learn to do this at this stage. At this stage, yeah. And another question coming to my mind. So if people are like th these groups you have are consultants, wouldn't be consultants anymore, but work in the sense of regenerative educators, if 
how, how would the world be different? What changes is that people no longer divide up and fragment their lives and fragment what they're working on. They only work on a whole buyer note. They have no market niches of demographics of people, women who are Hispanic, two children, three jobs. Uh, they quit treating people like um, um, buckets of people. And instead they think about their lives. And if you're gonna be a company and you think about people's lives, you begin to have an opportunity to design something inside. So everyone in the company is serving something in real life. Like when I was at Colgate Palmolive in South Africa uh, during Mandela's uh, presidency and a bit beyond, uh, we had people like Michelle, um, uh, Isaac Michelle, who was a detergent tower operator, who was now able to contribute to something because Stelio Sesos, the general manager, said, I want all of us being able to help the Black Africans be at the top of this company by six months from now, not five months when the or five years the Constitution offers. And so everyone who was in a role, and Isaac was a Black African who lived in Soweto Township, he committed to building small businesses with women in oral health, because it had to be related to the company, with dentists. And that transformed the life of every human being. He's one name doing one thing. But we had 300 people in the company, all of who either individually or in some kind of teaming were contributing something that also grew the business about 32% a year. Uh, it wasn't even a year. We did each of those six months. So we're growing the business, which would be one outcome you would get that's different. You get each individual committing to what I call promises beyond ableness. That's in the regenerative business, that description, for a community of people who have whole lives. And in that, you change the culture. We end up setting up, as a result, uh, neighborhood or township councils, which were advising um, Mandela and other politicians so that we were changing how democracy would work. Unfortunately, Colgate in New York moves Stalius out and the guy who came in behind it intentionally tried to undo it. But the 300 people we work with are still changing townships. That's, yeah, that, that's an impact. How does it change the life of the people who work as learn how to be a resource? These people in your groups, you know, the change agents whatsoever, um, learning to work in this way as being a resource um, to, to the, to the others, to a purpose. How does it change your, their lives in your experience? Because you're working with, the, with these people for maybe a longer period of time and see also how they develop over this personally. So you can look at my life and you have an answer to that. It becomes, they have meaningful lives. They don't get burned out. They don't wait for retirement. They don't focus on money. They focus on transforming their relationship everywhere they go within their families and they become what i call friends in the work where they all are working with frameworks helping each other their communities i have thousands of these people around the globe who are supporting each other they co-create ventures uh and they continue to take on bigger and bigger and bigger things with almost no fear and that would be probably the biggest thing for you and your group, doing exactly what they know is needed, not what they're being, uh, I was trying to remember what the word seduced was your word, into following because they're afraid, they're in, unseducible and they're also imperturbable. Like you can say horrible things to them, like I ever so often just see how much I can push and they don't become reactive because they know that it's, that being reactive gives them a loss of force and an inability to be in a meaningful and significant life. They become purposeful. That sounds like a wonderful end to this conversation. Can I invite anyone who is in 
any place listening who would like to explore one of those communities, we have one in EMEA, which doesn't have anyone for Africa or the Middle East right now, but we have all over Europe. We have a deep Pacific, people all over Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, the Philippines, and we have the Americas from North to South, all of whom are in these communities. So if anyone's curious about our conversation today, reach out to me at Carol at carolsanford.com. Absolutely. Um, I feel that a lot of people might uh, could really get interested. I would also really like to recommend everyone to read your latest book, The Regenerative Life. Um, I, I've read it, I'm always, almost through it, and I thought it is in, incredibly helpful, incredibly interesting, and I think a lot of the topics that we talked about yeah. right now will become for people even more transparent and even more clear and also workable uh, to, to get this inspiration, to get into this way of, of uh, regenerative thinking and a regenerative life that plays out so beautifully for you and a lot of the people that you have, have been and still are helping and supporting on, on their own way to find their own way of what regenerative life and thinking means for them. Lovely. I also have, if people sign up for my newsletter, I have a lot of free stuff I send out to people who are in my communities and on my newsletter. So yeah, don't guess, worry about it. I try and sell you something. I don't believe we will, in We will put all the links to the podcast so that people right. can immediately go also listen to your podcast. I've been listening right. to quite a lot of them. Every one of them is really interesting and mind-blowing and transformative. You're always caught up in your own thinking. So I, you always put like the, the finger in, in, in the wound and make it clear to us where we are, yeah, where we could think about it twice and, and find another, another option. So uh, I would invite everyone and we'll put everything uh, in the links to the podcast so people can immediately find the way to you. And thank you for offering people to um, yeah, write to you directly. I think that's a very generous offer. So thank you very much, Carol, for, this, for your um, time, for your dedication, for your um, sharing. And yeah. I hope to My talk pleasure. to you very, very soon and have a great day. Thank you very much to both of you.